I don't know what it was. He's walking upright like a man. Sightings in and around Vermont. Bigfoot sightings across New England have been reported. Red glowing eyes, about seven feet tall. Red eyes, big old fangs, claws coming out through. Three inches long, you know, just sharp as they could be. There has been another UFO sighting flying over the Royal Botanic Gardens. There are 500 UFO sightings in the world every month. The truth is out there. All right, so <laughs> I forgot something about my collection. Uh-oh, what'd you forget? I have a literal single box that's full of Cheetor stuff. I can believe like, that 100%. One, the one bin is entirely filled. I think I told you about this, but I've I've fallen back into Magic the Gathering. I have been seeing a lot of posts where you were like, is it bad that I really, really want to get back into Magic? Into Standard? Yeah. Yeah, into Standard even. Current yeah, standard. I actually have... What's it like so, trying to get back into a current standard for you? Because I've done that once before. Because I, I got back in right when Avacyn was coming back out. Um, Because well, I think yeah. I played at Ice Age. And then that that was the current standard when I first got in. They stopped for a while. And then I got back in at Avacyn. And I was like, holy crap. What is all of this other stuff I've never heard of before? Well, we uh we both started playing again at the same time. Yeah, true. Because that was the Innistrad... Um, what was the That's second what it was, one? Innistrad. Innistrad, and then the, the second one was Dark Ascension, which I drafted so much Dark Ascension. It's not healthy, the amount of yeah. Dark Ascension that I drafted. Um, and uh, Avacyn Restored. So yeah. we played that block together. I had the best f and It was my first f and in years, playing a constructed deck that... Basically, so we've got some friends who who were deep into magic. So mm -hmm. they would do a thing where there's this card shop, and they would sell pre-constructed decks with all their. Basically, you save all your cards from boosters. You make a deck, you sell it to a card shop, and they'll sell it back to new people for like twenty bucks or whatever, which is about the cost of an off-the-shelf deck. So I got mm -hmm. this off-the-shelf shelf zombies deck that our friend uh, Nick had built, and it mm -hmm. was a self-milling deck. I'm not going to go into the deep details because I'm sure not that many people are interested in Magic: The Gathering. But somehow I ended up in the final round playing against another individual who had been deep into magic for a very long time and had several very expensive cards. Uh, he had four uh, $50 cards in there. That, what was it? Spell? Um, I forget the name of the card. So anyway. Uh, Snapcaster Mage. Snapcasters. Yeah, he had four Those Snapcaster Those are worth mages. a lot more now. Are they? Way. Yes. So he, this guy has four Snapcaster Mages, and I'm down to have one card left. And two hit points left, right? So my dice is at two. I have one card left until I flip it. And then if I f don't win, then he wins the game. And he's got this crazy expensive deck. And he's also, I, I got him down to, uh, I think, two. I think we were both at two eight health. And he was like, there, there's no, literally no card that, because I couldn't, I didn't have the mana out to play anything really. I flip it. It's a grave crawler, deals two damage. I win. And he throws his deck. And it was amazing. It was glorious. You're forgetting the most important thing, though. He had to pick up his Snapcaster Mages from the ground. <laughs> no, the entire time he was drinking uh, apple, apple cider, cider vinegar. vinegar. Yeah. Yep. Yep. <laughs> it, you can't. You can't write something that funny. It was fantastic. Like, and as he's... a first time playing again, I was like, I can't stop now. I'm in too deep. I, I bought a deck at the same time as you. I bought uh, Da Beats. Oh, and that yeah. deck, I love that deck. I I made that into a wolf, uh, like a, a wolf tribal deck eventually. Yeah. And it was so much fun. Of course, I sold most of the cards in it, but, yeah, you know. I liked Da Beats so much. I built my next deck based, because Da Beats was like a green uh, deck. So I was like, I yeah. need to, they made Atlas, which was my green, but just get big shit out deck, which to be yeah. fair is most green decks. But yeah. it was good. The, your your uh, I loved your your artwork on the uh, <laughs> Primordial Hydra. I might have done some custom artwork for Primordial Hydra. That was very phallic. <laughs> yes, it was very good. Yeah. <laughs> um. 
but yeah, so I started playing Magic Arena. Is it fantastic? I've been seeing it's... news articles in my phone saying like it's killing uh, the other Magic games. Yeah, actually, I'd recommend giving it a shot. Is it it's totally amazing? free? It's it's totally free. Just give it a shot. It's okay. pretty freaking fun. Nice. Um, uh, I've been playing a green red. Um, All right. Deck. So I, I I've been calling it Gru Beats. Gru Beats. Okay. Because it's Gruel. Yeah. And it's inspired by the beats. <laughs> That's fantastic. So, uh, but yeah. Um, are there any special mechanics in current standard that are different from what I would have been used to in like in Estrada, yeah. Avacyn, Planeswalker well, stuff? Well, yeah, it's basically the same. Um, the the only like it's every every set has its own special flavor. Yeah, yeah. Mechanics, right? Like I think the last, I think the Dominaria block had like a history card or a history spell or something like that. It, it it's just it's all the same, but okay. different. The um, the next set that's coming out though yeah. is Buck Wild. Is it War of the Spark? It this is gonna age like fine uh, milk when it comes out. Um, but War of the Spark, I think it's Spark. It might be Sparks. Yeah, War of the Spark. So it's a um. Basically, it's Nico Bol- Nico Bolas's plan coming to fruition yeah which has been going on for like i, I want to say like nearly a decade in the magic lore um and there's like 39 planeswalkers or something like that yeah um oh my god see. i've never seen mtg arena i've just heard about it and read articles i'm yeah. just watching the video on their website and it looks fantastic oh it's super fun how do you get it's, boosters? Is it, you, is it you pay like uh, like you're buying normal boosters? Uh, you can buy them, but you can also earn them by free to play means. That's fantastic. Do they have yeah. pre constructed decks to start out with? Yes. That's yes. Th- that's bad. And so how's this? And, how's this? This is this is bad news for Brandon. So also how's like I'm picturing this is basically Hearthstone, so I can create an account and can I say, hey John, let's battle? Yes. Oh god damn it. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you can do uh one-on-one dueling. Oh as man. As long as you know the other person's uh account in their account number. I don't have that much free time, but I think I might have to Yeah, I'll I'll try to edit and then I'll try to find identify an cryptid and then Game of Thrones comes out and they'll do research. So I'm hopefully by the end of the week I'll have be able to <laughs> be like, "Hey John, it's... let's fight." It's very fun. Oh, man. I'm so happy. Also, um, I'm stoked because Tamio is getting a new Planeswalker, too. No. It's it's bad. It's bad news bears for John. This this set looks good. It looks um, so good. So, now that we've become a Magic the Gathering fan cast by two people who haven't played Magic in seven years. Has it been that long? 2012. I mean, do you count unstable? Well, no, because unstable's unstable. Yeah, it, it's its own thing. Like, I love unstable though. <laughs> I love it too. I think it's phenomenal. I found out. I realized that I I pulled the second uh sword of Dungeons and Dragons, which means I have to make a deck based around that. Oh, because now I have two of them. Yeah. Um. But yeah, I really want to make a, a a cube for. Um, unstable but yeah that's a whole nother thing um all right i think i should probably uh pull us away from magic the gathering for a bit <laughs> um so this week oh yeah gotta talk about the show right yeah oh yeah 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 there's a show and such yeah yeah we're um we're cryptopedia we talk about monsters cryptids urban legends now folklore um and a number of things uh, each week, one of your hosts will take you through the proverbial looking glass on some cryptid or folklore story, and the other one will make it hard for them to get through it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm John. I'm Brandon. Uh, and this week's cryptid uh, was first sighted, well, actually, it's an event. It's an event, okay. 
It occurred in 1924. Okay. The taxonomy of the cryptids were hominids, and its region was Oregon. Oregon? Yeah. Particularly, it was near Mount St. Helens. 19, when did Mount St. Helens go? Was that in the 1920s? Uh, I think that was in the 80s. What would it be? You said the humanoid, uh, it's an event. Is this... There's no way I'm going to be able to name it, but my guess is it'll be some form uh, of minor mass hysteria about aliens is what I'm going to guess. I don't know anything about the event, but I'm, that's what my guess is. Sort of like, you know that Leprechaun video where mm-hmm. everyone's like, I saw a Leprechaun in that tree. And then mm-hmm. everyone's like, yeah, no, it's real. The Leprechaun's right there. And then South Park did a bit on it. So my yeah. guess is it's some there was a sighting that was similar to that in Oregon. My guess is involving UFOs, right? Because this has got to be close to, uh, well, no, sci- 1950s, 60s sci-fi was closer to the 1950s and 60s. I don't know what it would be, but that's what I'm, that's what I'm guessing. That's that's the tone. My guess is at the tone of the the event. Okay, um, I let you go on that because I was just prepping some stuff. No. Uh oh. No. It's nothing like that. Uh, this week's episode is on the Battle of Ape Canyon. I've never heard of this. I this had never heard amazing. of it either. Yeah. Um, I found out about it on accident. That's so, the best way to find out about stuff. Yeah, it, it's it's pretty freaking great. I, uh, I found Ape Canyon on Google Maps too. So you can kind of like look at the maps to see what's going on. Okay. Um, like literally, I have a, a pin drop right on its location. Um, so. Oh, uh, okay. Ape Canyon is a canyon that's in like, uh, uh Mount St. Helens. Like it's it's near it. So it's it's named for the encounter we're about to discuss. It's oh. a gorge found along the edge of the plains of Abraham in the southeast shoulder of Mount St. Helens in Washington State. Um, the canyon has hiking, bike trails. You know, it's it's a place that people go. Yeah, like a state. Uh, it's like a state park type area. Thing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but there are two mysteries associated oh, with the canyon. Full of intrigue, I see. Yeah. The first is the disappearance of Jim Carter, a skier in the area who disappeared on, under mysterious circumstances. The second is a battle between several miners and a group of eight men in 1924. <laughs> I like those are two very disparate, uh, uh, different types of mysteries. My question about Jim Carter, and I'm sure that your research was probably in the latter of the two bullet points. Um, was he with a group of people or was he just a skier? Like a lone skier? Um. So we're a true true crime podcast now, as you know, and I'm focusing on that. Uh, <laughs> uh, he was a uh, he was a lone skier. Okay, I know what happened to him. He yeah he he it, he died. Um, oh, he's he's um yeah he's probably dead. But the because we live in an area where skiing is a big thing, and people travel to come ski at the yeah. different mountains here, and um, they do their best to make sure it never gets out. But like, I think Hunter this year, there were three, uh, three deaths. I, th- I forget. Well, like every year, all the mountains have like, Oh yeah. And it's a thing where people are skiing. There's other people around them. So especially if you go out to a large state area w- alone, that th- my guess is that's what happened. Yeah. Um, yeah, that, that, that tends to happen now. All joking aside, <laughs> okay. Uh July 1924. Uh in the July 16th, although some people say it's the 15th, so it's one of those like weird things. I did okay. find the article, but yeah. it wasn't from the most reputable of sources. Okay. And the Oregonian wanted me to pay $10 to even look at the article. So oh, I, Oregonian. I'm using the one that um people who are in support of the event are using because I want it as like a reference. Right? Yeah. Um, so in the July 16th issue of the Oregonian, there was a particularly conspicuous story 
detailing the fight between a group of miners and, in quotes, ape men. Uh Aha. The headlines in particular are kind of amazing. Um, The first is... This article is amazing. It's okay. Can I just read off all of them? Yes, read off all of okay. them. They are all they are all headlines to this story. Okay. Uh, in order from top to bottom, we have Big Hairy Indians, back of Ape Tail. Mountain, which is phenomenal. <laughs> which is amazing. <laughs> Mountain Devils, Mystery Grows Deeper. Giants said to roam hills. Shaggy creatures kill game by hypnotism, it is said. <laughs> Shaggy yep. hip. Oh god, ventriloquism is used. That's the end. That's the entire thing. It just says ventriloquism is used. Oh, there's more to the article. And then uh uh Redmond's editor at Hokheim gives theory of repeated af- I can't I, it's blurry. It's uh, reported attack, attack. Reported attack at Spirit Lake, which is um oh. near You okay there? That was just a good set of articles, man. That... Well, it's it's one article, and uh, we haven't even gotten to the article itself. Oh, it's a thing of beauty. Oh, I I stumbled across this while I was trying to research another Bigfoot event. Like, I was just making a list of Bigfoot events because I wanted to yeah. do another one. And I found this one, and I'm just like, oh, okay, that other thing I was doing is garbage. <laughs> yeah. And like oh, I said in my show notes... With headlines like that, who needs the copy? Yeah. Um, Holy cow. So this article's wild, right? Uh, The story wastes no time, practically assuming that the reader is already familiar with the basics of the story. And actually, it doesn't really even talk about the story at all. It's a (laughs) footnote. Oh, man. I've got, there's like two pages not talking about the event. (laughs) <laughs> i'm not joking but it is oh. relevant to the story um the big apes reported to have bombarded a shack of prospectors at mount st helens are recognized by northwestern indians as none other than the Sitco tribe of indians northwestern wow. indians have long kept the history of the Sitco tribe a secret because the tribe is the skeleton in the Northwestern Indian's closet. And this is all set in context. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, another reason the Indians have never divulged the existence of this tribe is that the Northwestern Indians know the white man would not believe the stories regarding the Sikko tribe. Uh. These facts are corroborated by Henry Napoleon, Callum tribe, J. James, Lumi tribe, and George Heisman, Quinault's tribe. So that, uh, I, I cut out a little bit there. Yeah, there's because, a lot going on. Yeah, I, I did cut out a little bit because um, there's a lot of like long dragging bits that were in that. Yeah. So I had to, to cut it down for time. Um, I like the but, idea of the prospectors being like, they're coming for a gold. So here's the thing. Yeah. In this article, there is nothing more about the Shack of Prospectors. No. I Well, actually, there's one sentence more. That's it. How many prospectors do you think you could fit in a shack? About five. Okay. <laughs> They're all standing <laughs> backs to the wall facing each other. <laughs> Basically, well, that's... <laughs> that's like, oh boy, Willie, it's getting pretty awkward in here. Like, they're all, I picture like all their mustaches are, are, are touching. Like, that's how close they are. Oh, yeah, no, they, their, their mustaches are definitely touching. Yeah. Um, it, it's, 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 this article is so insane to me. And it's like such a traditional, like, uh, it's such a traditional, um, what sword I'm looking for? Uh, like piece of early, yeah, twentieth century writing where it's like, like long stuff. It's so long and rambling and like it's amazing. But <laughs> before I get into it, uh oh, 
um, I did take a second. Yes. And I decided to research this independently before I went into the continued reading. Okay. Because Seat Co. Tribe, that's interesting. And I wanted to yeah. know a little bit more. Because um, I haven't heard of them before. No, I haven't heard of them either. All the tribes are real. I can confirm that. All the, the people who are at the bottom. Um, I got you. I've, I found current and modern sites for the Kualam tribe, uh, the Lumi tribe, in the Kinalt tribe. They okay. all exist. They're all from like the Puget Sound area. So what right? about that uh that Seatic tribe we got there? So the the Seatco tribe um Oh, Seatco. Sorry, I was re- yeah. I gotcha. Yeah, yeah, I it, see it. it's it's pronounced Seatco. I found yeah. I was able to gather a little bit of information about them from nativelanguages.org. Um a website and I quote dedicated to the survival of Native American languages. Mhm. Um the Sitko come from the storytelling tradition of the Puget Sound Salish people, um, of which there are two kinds of large, hairy, wild men. Mm-hmm. Uh, the night people are powerful but benign forest spirits, and the stick Indians are fearsome, malevolent man-eaters. So, basically, there's two... Ver- the Sitko is like a, uh, like a supernatural tribe. Yeah. But right. it's a sort storytelling tradition, right? Yeah, it's a storytelling. So it's just tradition. a cool, cool. Uh, it's a cool thing Basically. that they just tell each other. Just like, hey, so, here's a cool story, and then they, it's a good campfire stories and all that. Yeah, yeah. So I dug a little deeper, even deeper. Uh huh. Um, I found a chapter in Indian Legends from the Northern Rockies by Ella Elizabeth Clark. And as always, this is going to be in the show notes because mm-hmm. I like to have concrete trails. Um. In which one legend of the Stick Indians was collected in 1954 as recollected by Lucy Armstrong Isaac. The Stick Indians were just like human beings, except they were small, they wore deer skins around them, and they made strange sounds out in the woods. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I assume that much, right? Like, it totally makes sense. Yeah. The... <laughs> I can't <laughs> understand your accent. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um. So, the the person recounting the story goes into a little more detail. They say that the Stick Indians had the capability to turn themselves invisible, and they would demand offerings and would be blamed for disappearances. So, like, they would have they would offer them like dried salmon. Yeah, I like that they, they the idea that they turn invisible then make demands because that you're just walking through the woods and you're, you're so hey give me that you're t- there's literally no one there and you're like how I can't you're not a rat I don't understand give me that give me that I want it now I don't where are you yeah <laughs> it, it, yeah oh. yeah um overall this recollection sounds a lot more like a fairy or a puka than like Bigfoot yeah. Or Sasquatch, or any other of the ape creatures. Um, however, that being said, folklore does vary tribal group to tribal group, as we've seen in the second Thunderbird episode. Yeah. And the Skinwalker episode, for that matter. True, very true. Yeah. Um, additionally, one last thing I want to note before I go back into the article. Okay. Um, the Native Americans mentioned, I couldn't find any historical detail about them outside of this article. Okay. Which is not unusual because they're probably just normal people. Yeah, just normal uh, people that got interviewed or what have you. Yeah, but, like, you know, I couldn't find any, like, reports on them outside of this. So. Yeah, it's hard to so, find someone's Facebook trail in 1954. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's yeah. difficult. And, like, you know, I looked through obituaries. I did find a Henry Napoleon, but he was a Swedish immigrant to Oregon. Okay. So I assumed that he wasn't the one. Yeah, yeah, no. <laughs> like, this guy's claiming that he's a Native American, but he has a Swedish accent. It must be a very odd tribe he comes from. He's also, like, the whitest human being I've ever seen. <laughs> it's it's hard to look at him. He's reflective. Yeah, it's it's bad. Really, it's bad. <laughs> if, he, if he's standing in the snow naked, he just disappears. Yeah. <laughs> no. He leaves a very wide trail because the sun's reflecting off him and melting the snow. 
jeez. <laughs> oh, okay. The news report continues. Seco Indians are not less than seven feet tall, and some have been seen that were fully eight feet in height. They have hairy bodies like the bear. This is to protect them from the cold as they live entirely in the mountains. They kill their game entirely by hypnotism. I love it. They have <laughs> great supernatural powers. That's they fantastic. also have the gift of ventriloquism and have <laughs> deceived many by throwing their voice. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> you just hear you see you're walking through the woods and you, a voice to your left just goes, fuck you, and then you get punched from the other side. You're like, oh man. That would be amazing. That would be yeah. terrifying. Yeah. They're they're nightmare creatures, really. Yeah. Um So the the Seco are also able to mimic birds and are known for their practical jokes and kidnappings. So uh, <laughs> I love they make they make pretty good jokes and kidnappings. Yeah. Yeah. Uh some of the kidnapping victims return who are mostly women, uh, but most do not. <laughs> okay. Uh, some Native Americans even claim to have Cetic blood, which was mentioned in the news report, but I let's just say that those three sentences were about three paragraphs. Yeah, I, I think it's probably just, like, all the Native Americans who are, like, one's just named, like, Big Jerry, and they just go, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah big guy there, you must have sea tick blood in, or, uh, 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 blood in you. And he's just like, ha ha, very funny guys. Yeah. Hodor's got, uh, got a little bit of the giant's blood in him. He does, though. Yeah, okay. He, he's, old, I read the books, Old Nan and, and a Giant. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Um, <laughs> I read the books. Um, so it's interesting because uh, this does match up in some ways with uh, the rec- the account by Lucy Armstrong Isaac, but it does okay. also differ in significant ways, like the size of them. Right. But yeah. most of the other stuff is actually pretty close. Okay. Um, the last claim, the uh, some have claimed to have Seco C- blood, uh-huh. Uh huh. Actually, reminds me of the original description of the Sasquatch in the 1920s. Oh um, shit! Okay. Because people claim to be from the like, like, you know, have encountered members of the the Sasquatch tribe, and yeah. some claim to be like descendants of it and stuff like that. Um, they weren't considered ape men. They mm. were considered like another tribe of Native Americans. Okay. So, but that being said, uh, that's a lot. There's a lot more to talk about about that Mm -hmm. because the entire uh, Sasquatch lore Mm -hmm. hinges upon a frankly wild thing. Yeah. Like I have to. That that's its own episode. (laughs) I have to talk about that in its own episode. I didn't include anything else deliberately because if I included it, that would be the episode. Oh, God. (laughs) Um, So, at this point, the article takes a hard left turn. Uh, That's the best kind. Yeah. Henry Napoleon describes an encounter with the Seaco tribe. Oh, how'd that go? I'm about to tell you. Okay. It was at twilight when I came across an animal that I believed to be a big bear. But as I aimed at him with my gun, he looked and spoke to me in my own tongue. (laughs) <laughs> hey yeah. hey i'm a bear yeah, yeah. <laughs> hey you hey, hey. <laughs> what's going on yeah Why you point that gun at me also i learned english you why you should be impressed it took me three years <laughs> you have any berries i love berries i want your berries <laughs> please <laughs> all right see ya um, you have salmon. I think you have season. salmon. Which? I mean, they're out of that, season, so that'd be really nice. Now that you say that, Brandon. Yeah. I just realized that the fact that they're making offerings of salmon makes me think that this is a bear more than I did before. <laughs> I wrote all this copy, and I didn't. I didn't even. I didn't even uh, 
think to think of that. <laughs> oh, boy. Um, oh. He was about seven feet tall, and his body was very hairy. As he invited me to sit down, he told me that I had come upon him unawares, and that his mind had been had been projected to distant relatives of his. Otherwise, he would have never been seen. Hey, thanks for sneaking up on me. I I was just remote viewing some relatives. They give salmon. We all want salmon. All of us. Every single one of us. We all want sa- and pine cones. We like those too. Yeah, yeah. You got a good. You got Charmin. Yeah. <laughs> we need Charmin. Do, what do you happen to have Worcestershire sauce? Yeah. Uh, I need the two ply because after the Worcestershire oh, sauce, I die. <laughs> There, I don't know if you noticed, but it's all pine trees. Please tell me you brought some two ply. Please, I can't take another time. Yeah, I'm in pain just sitting here. <laughs> <laughs> the sap doesn't help clean anything. It just makes it worse. <laughs> <laughs> so after we talked for some time. He invited me to the Seatco home. Though it was now dark, the giant Indian followed the rail very easily. I, I don't... Oh, trail. Yeah. Like, <laughs> I I uh, typed this up because... <laughs> he I turns over his shoulder and he goes, You ate some bad mushrooms. I'm just a bear. This is a bad idea for you to follow me. <laughs> it's not a good idea. Mind the third rail. What? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, we're in New York City now. I don't know how it happened. <laughs> um, then we began on an underground trail, and after hours of travel, we came to a large cave, which he said was the home of his people, and that they lived during the winter in different caves on Vancouver Island. This is on Vancouver Island? It's close. Holy, okay, so there's a show, if you have Hulu, called Alone. Yep. That's amazing. And here's the premise of the entire show. They get all these different people of different backgrounds and they drop them off on an island. But here's the deal. They they put them in geographically isolated areas so they will never see each other. Mm-hmm. So they literally have to survive alone. And it isn't for a period of time. It is if you are the person who is alone the longest, you win. And they don't tell you when other people hit the, um, the emergency button to ha- get a helicopter to pull them out or anything like that. So you're literally alone, and you if you're there the longest, you win like a million dollars, but they don't tell you when you're done. And it's fantastic. And there's like a hippie who's just like, get like, hey man, I found some uh, uh, berries. Oh, like a salmon. And then there's like this big dude from the Amer- from like Georgia who's like, like set going over how well prepared he is for living in that environment. He hears like a wolf, and then it's like a night vision sequence of him just like, running and he's like i can't take any more men and he like beefs out and then you hear the hippie like oh some wolf friends are here <laughs> like because they can hear the same pack but yeah. they're they're just like they just can't make it to each other <laughs> he's, and there's another guy where there's like of the full episode it's just him failing at catching a mouse but the mouse keeps eating all his berries <laughs> and it's like a very tom and jerry like he's clearly slightly losing it <laughs> 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 well, they were bad berries. Like, it turned very clearly into a very personal vendetta. <laughs> like, it was fantastic. <laughs> it's I highly recommend it if you've got uh, Hulu. It's called Alone. It's I fantastic. Think I, I think I watched the first episode. You, I might have made you watch one episode. Yeah. <laughs> it's so good. It, it's pretty funny. Yeah. Um, he also told me that the reason they were not seen very much was because they had a strange medicine. That they rubbed it over their bodies. We call so that, it lube. <laughs> it lets us get through the tubes. Yeah. We're so fast. Shoo. Um. <laughs> this, I, I really think this might have been a guy who ate bad mushrooms and saw a bear. It's, from how you're describing it. Brandon, it's totally possible. <laughs> um. They rubbed over their bodies so that it made them invisible. And, combined with their waki ni sing, or hypnotic powers, made them very strong tamawanis, uh, which is spirit power, like spirit I think. men? 
Men who have yeah. spirit power? So yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's a Tamina Weiss Men. So I, I think that it's like spiritual beings, like powerful spiritual beings. Um, <laughs> I'm picturing I, just a large, hairy person and um, just someone who followed him and he's rubbing stuff all over his body and he's talking using telepathy and he's just like, it's crazy how I can talk to you without moving my mouth, right? Just rubbing his body. <laughs> That would be great. Yeah. That would be legitimately great. Yeah. <sighs> they also told me that they could talk to almost any Indian language, uh, talk almost any Indian language of the Northwest. The next day, they led me out, and just as twilight, just at twilight, I came out of the underground trail, and they accompanied me to within a mile of the Indian village I was staying at. So yeah, like once again, I'll, I, I'll say it again: all the Indians are sudden contact and all that mm-hmm. stuff so um i i actually don't know what the preferred term is these days i've seen american indian is a common one mm-hmm. um and native american are common so. <laughs> hey call me anything just don't call me late for dinner hey all right well that's a thing you just said yeah um so i just want to reiterate uh i can't find any historical record record of napoleon outside of this report okay um it doesn't discount the story it would just help give me context as to who he was Mm -hmm. like you know like what he did where he went all those things but that's that's a whole nother problem won't get into that uh the description of the seat coat reminds me of the stories of elves and other ephemeral beings it kind of like it kind of reminds me of the hold the folk a little bit yeah because they kind of are like these mythical not existing in real space type things um it's practically archetypical like yeah it, it's like almost to the point that uh a lot of fantasy novels kind of read like this interdimensional bigfoot yes yeah so <laughs> steal my thunder <laughs> so there are several noteworthy features of the story it happens at twilight a fairy in- ephemeral and unreal time Mm -hmm. The creature is is capable of speaking a number of languages, and it has a fairly impractical living situation. Why would the Seco tribe to Victoria, uh, not Victoria, Vancouver Island in the winter? Like, I feel like it would be colder, right? Yeah, it's it's pretty rough, man. Um, Yeah, like, I I just don't, I I don't know anything about what the weather in the Vancouver... Can't tell us bumping the microphone, hang on. There we go. <laughs> That's how it goes. That's how it goes. Um, I don't know anything about, like, what Vancouver Island is like during the winter, so I'm not really speaking to it from a point of knowledge. Watch but... alone. Okay. Um, <laughs> additionally, it's our first Psychic Bigfoot on the podcast. Oh, hell yeah. It was I only like a it. matter of time. It's only a matter of time before we had a psychic Bigfoot, and it's going to be glorious. Yeah. It, I personally think psychic Bigfoot is just an excuse for why we don't have, like, real evidence and, like, interdimensional Bigfoot and all that stuff. But that's a yeah. Um, <laughs> the article talks a little bit more about the trickster nature of the Seatco, but honestly, it would be a restatement of what we talked about before. Yeah. Um, the article is in the show notes if you want to read the full copy. Um, and like I said before, they talk almost nothing about the event itself. There's mm-hmm. a small coda at the end about George Miller, the chief of police, going to investigate reports of the Kelso miners, mm-hmm. and that is it. <laughs> so I read that, and I got to that point, and I'm like, oh, no, the the, the episode's over. I, I can't do this. There's oh, nothing no. here. There's nothing to work with. But. Here's yeah. what happened. Uh oh. I found a pamphlet. Oh, pamphlets are the best. And it was written by one of the miners. Oh, that's fantastic. Uh, in the show notes, I have pictures of the pamphlet. Oh, is it called? Oh, I thought the Eight Men of Mount St. Helens. Yep. With some fantastic artwork. Mm-hmm. This guy must have went to school to draw that. So it wasn't the. It, the artwork is not by uh, the miner. It's by some guy that he hired. He paid for that? Yeah. 
Okay. Yeah, or or someone did it for free. I don't know. Yeah, um, I mean, like the the text is centered to itself, but not on the pamphlet. Yes, you are correct. It is a very <laughs> interesting uh, presentation. Yeah. Um, I found out. So this just reminded me. Yesterday, I was in Uptown Kingston. Yeah. And I found out that the used bookstore in Uptown Kingston sells zines. No. Yes. Walk in there and check out the zine selection. Okay. It's pretty great. Um, also, Uptown Kingston, way more hipster than I was expecting. Yeah, it's it's like half I, dead, half hipster. Yeah. <laughs> it's, I haven't but, been I haven't been there in a while. You know, but it's ha- somehow for like there's more double parking than, than there used to be <laughs> at the same time. Yeah. But yeah, man. There's uh lots of coffee shops and lots of uh bars, basically. Yeah, it's I super... mean, you know what turned hipster when we got the rough draft, which is a bookstore slash bar. Really? Yeah. Oh, where where's that? They're in uh so if you know where the four uh stone buildings are, like the original colonial buildings. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like the Senate House. So or... the, the Well not the Senate House. That it's um or are you talking uh, about the Hoffman House? I don't know the name of the streets. Basically, if you follow, uh, I don't know which one goes, like, where the Wall, Wall and John Street is. You follow one of the streets down to the end. Mm-hmm. The four, There's, oh, it's one of the original, if you do the Burning of Kingston, one is still, like, a historical. Like, okay, gotcha, here's gotcha, all gotcha. The, the artifacts in that. The yeah. one across the street from that, um, if you, south, is the Rough Draft, which okay. is the bookstore slash bar. Uh, I forget what the building, if you go west from there is but then you go back up north now you're on the other side of the street it's also a bar called the stockade after the stockade district so you've got <laughs> you can't you can't swing a dead cat without hitting a bar in uptown kingston at this point no, literally i think actually no actually quite literally almost every street has multiple bars honestly i think the only store that's still like original to when i last was there is the Dallas Hot Wieners. Dallas Hot Wieners, man. They're, yeah, 100%. You've got, well, you've got Dallas Hot Wieners, and then you've got, um, uh, what's that one bar? you got that what the other bar. Yeah. And then there's the bar next to it. There's literally bars that have share a wall with other bars. Yes. <laughs> you can walk down the street, and there's, like, <laughs> you'll pass four bars yeah. on one side. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Say one thing about Kingston, we like our drinking. <laughs> that's that's fair. I mean, there's a lot of stuff I can say about that, but we're we'll, yeah. we'll let's make this podcast a little more listenable to people who are not yeah. in the Hudson Valley. Yeah. <laughs> um it's all farmers markets and drinking and like vintage shops. <laughs> a lot of drinking. Yeah. Like a I mean, reckless amount. Like, like at the farmers market when, when, in the summer, I'll go there. <laughs> it's literally to get like onions, corn, and whiskey. Like there's literally you get there's multiple uh, uh, distilleries at our farmers market. <laughs> uh. So the pamphlet was written in 1967. <laughs> yeah, uh, it was dictated by Fred Beck, who was one of the miners, and recorded by his son. Yeah, it came out. After 43 years of silence, Ugh. it should be noted, 1967 is the same year as the Patterson-Gimlin film. Oh, okay. That being said, the site hosting the self-published pamphlet alleges it was written September 27th, and the footage of the Bigfoot was taken October 20th. Now, oh yeah, the month the before, yeah, like oh no, no, it's not. We're not influenced by it at all. It came out the month before. See, we wrote it in this pamphlet that you just saw after that film. Yes, so yeah. I want to point out it is self-published. Uh huh. Okay. So I couldn't find any like copyright information for it because it is self-published. Yeah. So, uh, I don't know. If that's true. <laughs> Regardless, um, the pamphlet is 24 pages long. Okay, that's a long pamphlet. I'm going to cut out a lot of it. Because, uh, 
We'll get to why I'm cutting it out. <laughs> um, the names in the story are pseudonyms, apparently. Which, of course, makes it even harder to verify literally any claims. Yeah. Uh, and also, the time differential makes it impossible to verify anything, like, any physical evidence. Yeah. So It's almost like they didn't want you to find out. Yeah, it's it's weird. Yeah. It's interesting how that happens on these kinds of pamphlets. Mm-hmm. It sure is. <laughs> <sighs> what we're trying to say is, take this with a grain of salt. Okay. So, first of all, I wish to give an account of the attack and tell of the famous incident of July 1924 when the hairy apes attacked our cabin. We had been prospecting for six years in the Mount St. Helens and Lewis River area at, in southwest Washington. Okay, so if prospecting doesn't turn into mining after six years, find a new spot. Yes. <laughs> That's yeah. all I'm going to say, which reminds me of the, uh, the, uh, the Ballad of Buster Scruggs. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, what was it? The, uh, which one was that? That's the... He's going to find the vein. Or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, what, what was the name of that sketch? Uh, the prospector. No, maybe? it 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 had a specific. It was like um. Let me see. Oh yeah. All go gold candy. Mister yeah. Pocket is what he called Mr. it. Mister Pocket. It. That's what that's he called it. it. That's what it was. That's what I was you, thinking. Mr. Pocket. About. I'm gonna find you. Yeah. So. It's kind of like that. This story. Well. We'll get into it. Um, we had, from time to time, come across large crack, tracks by creek beds and springs. In 1924, I and four other miners were working our gold claim. So apparently they did Oh, uh, okay. Um, the Vander White. It was two miles east of Mount St. Helens in a, near a deep canyon now named Ape Canyon which was so named after the, an account of the incident reached the newspapers. So he's setting mm -hmm. the, the scene a little bit. Hank, a great hunter and a <laughs> good wins, woodsman. Hey, Bobby. <laughs> <laughs> was always a little apprehensive after seeing the tracks. The tracks were large, and we knew that no an known animal could have made them. The largest was measured at 19 inches long. Oh, it's got a big foot. Yeah, how about that? Yeah. Also, he definitely is not attracted to Hank in any way. <laughs> uh, a little bit of context for the story, as you, as I said before. Um, and he gets right to the monkey on this story. <laughs> right to the monkey. Which is a, a reference to uh, a, king, a song called King Kong. Oh. Um. Honestly, it's actually like the setup to an okay to middling horror movie. <laughs> I'm not going to say it's a good horror movie. Yeah. Because they're a little bit too in your face about what's going to happen. The foreshadowing. Mm -hmm. um, but you know what? Whatever. It does sound like a, a good bad horror movie. We had been hearing noises in the evening for about a week. We heard a shrill, peculiar whistling each evening. Which I, of course, am thinking of um, big enough. Oh, I was thinking, uh, 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 what's the, not Viagra, the, the, the male enhancement, uh. Oh, oh, uh, uh, oh, oh. Yeah. Um. We're gonna definitely need, we're gonna definitely need to adjust that a little. Yeah, or uh, um, male enhancement whistling. Uh, Enzite was the Enzite. Name of it. I I don't know why it was so hard for me to remember that because if you stayed up late in the uh, early early to late aughts, you always saw that commercial. It was every other commercial. <laughs> yes, especially on uh, Adult Swim, which is yeah. weird considering the fact that I think Adult Swim's target audience should not need that. Yeah, probably not. 
oh my god, we I have so much copy left. I should probably <laughs> keep going. Uh, we would hear it coming over from one ridge, and then hear it and answer your list go from another ridge. Wow, I butchered that. We also heard a sound, which I could best describe as a booming, thumping sound. Just like something was hitting itself on the chest. So, I mean, could be normal mountain sounds. Yeah. Could um, be the Enzite working. It could be the Enzite working. Hank asked me to accompany him to the spring about 100 yards from our cabin to get some water and suggested we take our wife rifles to be on the safe side. Uh-huh. We walked to the spring, and then Hank yelled and raised his rifle at that instant. I saw it. It was a hairy creature, and he was about 100 yards away on the other side of the little canyon, standing by a pine tree. Did you like my whistling? Tree. I yeah. was whistling for you guys. I hope you liked it. Yeah. <laughs> Did the pills work? <laughs> um, it dodged behind the tree and poked its head out from the side of the tree. And at the same time, Hank shot. So the pills did work. They did work. Uh, <laughs> I could see the bark fly out from the tree from each of his three shots. Someone may say that it was quite a distance to see bark, bark fly, but I saw it. Yes, 100 yards is a long way away. Yeah. Um, the creature I judged to have seen about seven feet tall. I judged to have been about seven feet tall with blackish brown hair. It disappeared from our view for a short time, but then we saw it running fast and upright about 200 yards down the little canyon. I shot three more times before it disappeared from view. Stop shooting, guys! Yeah. Guys, stop shooting in the future in Washington. There's going to be an incident just like this, but it's a hunter shooting at a normal person. Ah! <laughs> also, in the show notes, I have a picture of, like, what 100 yards and 200 yards looks like from a position. Yeah. And at 100 yards, you're not you're definitely not going to see bark flying. And at 200 no. yards, you're not going to be able to distinguish that something's seven feet tall. Listen, I've played PUBG. I know my distances. Okay, yeah, sure. Um, you know your distances in PUBG, and yeah. also there's a map that tells you how far things are away. <laughs> uh, That's how I know it. Yeah. We took the water back to the cabin and explained the affair to the rest of the party, and we all agreed, including Hank. He is, like, in love with Hank in this story, I swear, to go home the next morning as it would be dark before we could get in the car. Uh, we agreed it would be unsound if he caught by the darkness on the way out. Um... Although I should amend that, it's not wrong if he loves him. Yeah. But you gotta you gotta be true to yourself, man. <laughs> um <laughs> Nightfall found us in our pine log cabin. We had built the cabin ourselves and had made it very sturdy. It stood for years afterwards and was visited by many sightseers until a few years ago when it was burned to the ground. The circumstances <laughs> of the fire I do not recall. <laughs> As a gambling, uh, well, if he doesn't, he got drunk and he burnt the cabin down. Yeah, basically. It, it, it definitely existed. Yeah. Uh, about midnight, we were all awakened. The noise that had awakened us, a tremendous thud against the cam- cabin wall. Um, some of the chinking had been knocked loose from behind the logs and fell across Hank's chest. So that's like the, the mud bits in between the wall. Yeah. Yeah. Um, which I just say for the sake of people who might not know. Then we heard a great commotion outside. It sounded like a great number of feet trampling and rattling over a pile of our unused shakes. I don't know what shakes are. Is that I... the, the thing? No, that's the pan is what I was thinking of. Oh, uh, oh yeah, no, that that is. Like, you know, you, you yeah, shake. Yeah, or it's the... like a, a pan that has a series of uh, yeah, different yeah. grooves in it, and the grooves are to catch the heavy material as the water flows over them. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay. Um, That makes total sense now. We grabbed our guns. Hank squinted through the space left by the, uh, where they had, had, like, you know, popped out. Mm -hmm. Um, By actual count, we only saw three of the creatures together at one time, but it sounded like there were many more. This was the start of the famous attack of which so much has been written in the Washington and Oregon papers throughout the years. Most accounts tell of a giant boulders being hurled against the ha- cabin, and some even fell through the roof, but that's not quite the case. There were very few rocks in the area, and it is true that the smaller ones were hurled at the cabin, but they did not break through the roof, but hit with a bang and rolled off. 
He's some. just trying to brag about how sturdy that cabin they built was. Yeah, he totally is. Because earlier he was saying, how st- he was bragging about how sturdy he was earlier. Now he's like, oh, yeah. I told you guys. I told you. I know how to make a cabin. You know that, right? <laughs> you okay, Hank? <laughs> no, I'm, I'm, I'm losing my mind. Some did fall through the chimney of the fireplace. Some accounts state, I was hit in the head by a rock and not unconscious. This is not true. It might be true. <laughs> if if he's like even accurate as to having been there. Yeah. Um The only time we shot our guns that night was when the creatures were attacking our cabin. When they would quiet down for a few minutes, we would quit shooting. I told the rest of the party that maybe if we saw if they saw we were only shooting when they attacked, they might realize that we were only defending ourselves. Mm-hmm. We did shoot, however, when they climbed up on our roof. We shot round after round through the roof, and we had to brace the huge log door with a long pole taken from the bunk bed. Which, they have bunk beds. Yeah, um, I like that idea. Yeah. They're just miners in bunk beds. It's pretty good. They're, uh, they're busy, like, you know, drinking whiskey and telling tall tales. Just, I don't know. One of them throws the whiskey on the floor. It's yeah, like, like yeah, they sleep we gotta, we gotta walk a, there. Uh, the, the guy on the bunk the like there's one miner on the bottom he's he's got the the thing coming out of his nose like the big snot bubble like in cartoons i'm imagining one of them is dressed up in like sleep clothes and has one of those hats yeah um we did shoot however when they climbed up on our roof uh i already read that bit um i lost my place okay yeah here we go uh the creatures were pushing against it and the whole door vibrated from the impact we responded by firing many more rounds through the door. They pushed against the wall and the ca- the walls of the cabin as if they were trying to push the cabin over. The attack continued for the remainder of the night with only short intervals between. This is an extremely long description, by the way. Yeah. Um, a most profound and frightening experience occurred when one of the creatures, being close to the cabin, reached an arm through the space, like, you know, the opening, yeah. and seized our ax- one of our axes by the handle. <laughs> a much, much written about incident in a true one before the thing could pull the axe out i swiftly turned the head of the axe upright so that it got caught on the walls and at the same time <laughs> hank shot and barely missing my hand that's pretty funny I, i'm i'm yeah the attack ended just before daylight just as soon as we were sure it was light enough to see we cautiously came out of the cabin it was not long before I saw one of the ape-like creatures standing about 80 yards away near the ape canyon. I shot three times, and it toppled over the cliff down into the gorge, some 400 feet below. Where there would be no physical evidence because no one could access it. Exactly. <laughs> then, Hank said that we should get out of there as soon as possible and not to bother to pack our supplies or equipment. After all, it is better to lose them than our lives. We were only too glad to agree. We brought out only that which we could get in our pack sets and left $200 in supplies, powder, and currently equipment behind. This is a very, like, self-aggrandizing tale. Yeah. Um, it's a thrilling story, but it's wholly unverifiable, and it's a, it, ha- it was recorded supposedly 43 years later. And, also, and, you, and you know what helps make people think things are true? When you're telling them a story that is supposedly happened, and you keep saying, also, this is all true, in the middle of the story. <laughs> yes. Yes. That, yeah. that definitely makes me think it's true. Yeah. Yeah. Um, also, why did he kill one? Wouldn't that just make them angrier? <laughs> I don't know. No, they, they, they realized mortality is real and then just got bummed out and left. <laughs> they face their own their own uh short lifespan and well, yeah like, oh man maybe we need to change our lives maybe we have to get out of these these lava tubes because by the way those lava tubes there are lava tubes near mount st helens because it is an active volcano yeah um so yeah I, and i got a little picture of uh of frank back fred back holding his gun yeah Look at him, sitting there all saucy. He also uh, reproduced another, like, article in the pamphlet. Uh, oh, the, did he? The, the headline was, Legendary Mount St. Helens Ape Man Called Legitimate. Oh, um, good. By who? 
I don't know. <laughs> it, it was we- it was a very weird article. <laughs> it was from 1964. Um, it was in the Longview Daily News, and it recorded stories about Ape Canyon, including the Great Ape Hunt of 1924, which was the aftermath of the battle, um, which supposedly found footprints, but I didn't really find a whole lot on that. Um, and it nebulously, nebulously mentions other sightings, and the author seems to make a claim that the Jim Carter guy was abducted yeah. or killed by the, the ape men, which kind of feels dishonest yeah if, if you want to read it you can read the uh the article which we've linked in the show notes but i don't know it, it felt like weirdly um voyeuristic yeah i i think that's the word i'm looking for um but it just felt like strange mm-hmm. um there is a chapter three of this but yeah. it gets, like, super deep into spiritualism, and it okay. really doesn't fit in the episode. Um, but he does talk a lot about the notion of psychic Bigfoot. That's um, fantastic. Yeah. It's, it's, yeah, it's it's a weird thing. <laughs> um, if you want to read it for yourself, you can. But this would be probably a two-hour podcast if I read that. <laughs> And it's not interesting. At least it wasn't to me. Okay. So, a couple years later, um, 13 years later, Mount St. Helens erupted. Ape Canyon was affected by the eruption. It spewed all of the, the ape men out, and they, they were littered the canyon. Well, well, the thing is, it was covered in ash, right? Like a okay. huge layer of ash. So, even if you knew where, like, even if you were looking for the site, yeah, it would be under ash, and that's a whole thing. Um, I didn't look into a whole lot of details on the specifics, but I, my guess is probably, to me, it seems like it would just be basically destroyed. Yeah. However, apparently, in 2013, okay. Mark Mercel and his Washington-based Dark Waters Paranormal Investigation Team claimed to have found the site of the cabin from Fred Beck's story after five years of searching. Oh, shoot. Okay. Good. They so then quoted, they got lots of uh, physical evidence and, yeah. and artifacts and, and you know, they, they saw the state of the cabin and compared it against his story and saw that, yes, mm-hmm. there were, like, bullet holes in the door because they were shooting through it and, and all that. Well, the cabin was just, like, its foundation. It was okay. Under, it was like they had to – I think they had to dig for it. Mm-hmm. Um. They're quoted as saying the following on their Facebook page, which I couldn't find this actual post because it was from 2013. Yeah, and that's a pain. I didn't want to. I didn't feel like looking through that much Facebook posts. That's that's too much work. That's too much. <laughs> um, due to the sp- the sensitive nature of this historic site, I am really, really, really sorry, but we can't go into specific details about the site's location. Please don't ask. That was all caps. Huh. Uh huh. Um, it does appear that they found human artifacts because they had pictures. Uh huh. Uh huh. But there are literally no updates since that 2013 post. It seems that the Dark Waters Paranormal Investigations team credibility credibility could be a bit murky. Uh... <laughs> yeah. Ah, oh, jeez. So yeah. Uh, it's a good story, but yeah, and it's it, like that they found human artifacts doesn't mean anything, by the way, because given that there was a bunch of miners, yeah, there's going to be human artifacts all over anywhere. You've got people working for for years on doing things. Yeah, there's gonna so, be stuff left behind. It, it, it's one of those things where it's like, eh, yeah, whatever. Um, the fuck. motion in my back here. <laughs> all right anywho um that's all i got on the story okay it's an interesting one it's kind of mm. wild yeah but I, I don't think it holds a whole heck of a lot of water personally i don't think so either the the hardest thing about it is like the lack of verifiability of the claims yeah and the proximity of the event to the report uh-huh so 
I don't know. It, it just stinks of of uh, cash grab. Oh, does it? Well, no. I mean, like if you're the pamphlet kind of stinks of like a cash grab. Yeah. <laughs> so the actual story itself, there something happened, but I don't know if it happened the way that they said it happened. That's no. What I'm to say. Yeah. Um. Anywho, uh, as always, if you want to get in contact with us. You can go to CryptopediaCast.com. Our Instagram is at CryptopediaCast, and Twitter's the same. Are you trying to do, like, an ASMR ad read? No, I wasn't. <laughs> I, was just, I was just trying to do, like, a, a fancy ad read. Oh, fancy? I like your fancy yeah. ad read. I guess, I guess it's ASMR, then. <laughs> so now I'm in your right ear, and now I'm in your left ear. That's, that's not a stereo microphone. <laughs> I don't care. <laughs> um, uh, if you want to email us, it's cryptopediacast at gmail.com or us at cryptopediacast.com. Um, we have a Patreon with several support tiers. Uh, if you want to see the show notes, $2 and up in the uh, Hoop Snake tier. And if you want to hear premium content, Jackalope tier. Yeah, man. We got uh, what are our, our premium content so far? We got. You read the uh, the ballad of Shank Daddy X. Yep. I read. Um, I've got two sort of like continuing series, is, is which is uh, Lovers Lane Relationship Advice and um, Ten Lilyfield Lane, which is a like a, a narrative fiction type of deal. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, pretty good. Yeah, pretty good. It's um, getting back to that time of year where I'm going to start finding more stuff to write about in Lilyfield Lane <laughs> now that I have to do yard work again. Pretty much. Because it's all about uh, general inconveniences, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. General inconveniences that inevitably lead to someone's death. <laughs> it's pretty good. Yeah. Um, we have a Facebook group where we post stuff. Uh, last week's episode, we talked about a Hornswoggle video. Yup, yup. You could find that there. Um, if, you, if you'd be so kind to rate, review, and subscribe, we would be very happy. Um, and spread the podcast. Share it. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you think someone will enjoy it, let them know about it. Um, if you have any monster requests or stories, uh, I'd appreciate it. We both would. And if you have good sources, we'd appreciate that even more. <laughs> yeah. Everyone knows that a good source is worth about 2,000 words. About. <laughs> um, if you got creepypasta or cryptopasta, you can send it our way and I might do a read of it. Probably not. <laughs> uh you could find me on instagram at donkey underscore hands my website is boyerb.com my email is brandon at cryptopediacast.com and my twitter is at crypto brandon uh if you want to get in contact with me at view 2057 on instagram on twitter i'm at jf dunham i have a website john and if you want to email me it's john at cryptopediacast.com and our art is done by Tom Hill. You could find him on Instagram at Thomas Michael Hill. His website is greatergloryco.com and his email is tommikehill at gmail.com. As always, I'm John. I'm Brandon. And things are going to get weird. It's a crazy story, man. <laughs> uh, I I I found that and I was just like, all right, well, I was going to do the one about the guy when he got kidnapped by Sasquatch, but now I'm going to do this one.